Greetings, ladies and Mandeljets, and welcome to this latest episode of uh, Tales, Tales from, from Outer from space. Out space. space, where I take a space-related story from around the internet and read it out loud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Please don't forget to do the usual YouTube gumph, because if you don't, the nanite swarms will steal your other sock. But more importantly, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I'd quickly like to thank the following Tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Data Magnet and Bob the Dragon. Thank you very much. Story number one. Stress written by Not Strong Bad. Uh, yes, when I said, uh, when I said, uh, do you really, do you really think you can win? I, I mean, uh, he, he didn't even have claws. And he thinks he could challenge me to... Uh... The Centaurian mercenary, immersed in regaling his two broodmates with his tales of daring, looked up as I walked into the grimy bar. One of his four eyes was already drooping from the almost empty jar of whiskey in front of him, and the other three darted around in sudden panic, drunkenly trying to pass these chances of escaping. When I didn't approach him, he seemed to regain his alcohol-augmented courage, and continued his grand tale. And he, he thinks that he can uh, challenge me. And, and I, I, I said... The mercenary trailed off, unable to tear his eyes from me. Although I was curious to hear where he was going with his story, I was more concerned with the oil-stained bar about 15 feet in front of me. And I didn't take offense. Why should I? I know our reputation. I still check my waist for my K-bar. No use getting complacent now. Though in the dingy haze of a small bar, I doubt anybody noticed anyways. Do you have any scotch? I asked the Cerulean bartender. She was cute for a Cerulean, once you got past the extra arms. Good lord! I've been by myself for too long. Sure thing, she said, as I sat on a wobbly stool. On the rocks? Neat, and make it a double, please. I told her, trying to ignore the increasing amount of patrons looking at me. It's been three years since the war ended, but I still haven't gotten used to the stares, to the sneers. Humans are normally accepted on every Republic planet, but I can almost smell the fear mixed with revulsion in the air, like a bloated corpse on the other side of a tall barrier. You know, it's there, but you can't do much about it. Three years of living on this rock, of living amongst the locals. Three years of constant vigilance, of doubling back on my route, of sitting on my back in the corners, of checking all exits. The war is over, I told myself. My mission is over. Chill, I say. I tell Turner the same thing every second Saturday, although I doubt he could hear me. As the bartender brings me my scotch, she notices me staring at the Centaurian mercenary in the wall-to-wall -wall mirror behind her. I continue to stare until he looks away. Those feckers believe that staring at an enemy in the mirror gives them strength, or some such garbage. I sigh, wondering if this guy is trying to make a point. So, what brings you around here? The bartender asks me. Can't say I've seen you before in my bar. I look at her for a long minute, trying to determine the meaning behind her words. I become so accustomed to code a conversation that it takes me an uncomfortably long moment to realize that she was genuinely curious. Another unfortunate gift from my friends at the academy. I'm visiting, I lie. I live in the capital, but I was visiting with my old friend. I finish quietly, almost too quiet for her to hear. I set up my drink, desperate for something to keep my mouth occupied. I have entirely too much on my mind and have no desire to share it with her. In reality, I live about ten blocks south of the bar, probably in the same crappy hab complex she lives in. I just don't leave my place very often. Why would I? Not much for me to do in this city other than drink and feck and fight. Although the latter has been lacking for a while now and the thick layer of smoke, the stench of the foundries, the choking masses of people. It's all a little too much. So I stay inside. It's better that way. That sounds like fun, she says, 
I used to have a friend that lived close by, but she moved off planet a few months ago. And now I have... Uh, as she keeps talking, I tune her out, wondering how in the seven hells this perky Cerulean ended up in this crappy dive. She's still talking when I see, in the long mirror, the Centaurian Merc get up and half saunter, half stumble towards the bar. Towards my spot in the bar. Towards me. God damn it. As I watch him get closer, I quickly take stock of his potential threat level. It's a habit I can't shake, no matter how much I drink or dope or try to get beaten out of my skull in the local combative leagues. The local illegal combative leagues. Designate Mark 1, right hand on his waist, one hand on his left coat pocket, a small bulge in his coat on his right hit. Gun? Not sure, but probably. Keep going, but watch the hands. Loose pant legs could mean backup gun in the ankle holster. Gotta keep an eye on that. He's walking casually, so casually, it doesn't quite look right in his frame. Crap. His two bodies just shifted positions. Designated Mark 2 II and 3. Two watches, the exit. Three scooches to the edge of the booth, trying hard to look in any direction except mine. But I can see his eyes quickly scanning me. Double crap. Mr. One keeps approaching. I can feel my adrenaline levels rising quickly. My heart is beating a ragged tattoo in my chest, and I can feel it in my temples. Everything becomes sharper. I can smell the rancid sweat, feel his lumbering footsteps. He looks like he's at the end of a tunnel. The bartender yammering becomes a low, annoying buzz in the background. My breath becomes quicker and shorter. Like my brain is focusing oxygen into my body, priming it like a rusty fuel pump. The thrumming with energy, my limbs begin to shake, as if begging me to let them loose. My right hand tightly grips the pommel of my service-issued blade, sitting on my belt under my shirt. As one gets close, I notice he's baring his teeth. Is he about to try and rip out my throat? Jesus Christ. I've heard rumors of Centaurian bloodlust, but I've never seen them do it. Wait, what? Is he talking? Hey man, are you a human that whipped my row last week? I look at him, trying to put meaning to his words. He stopped walking and is now standing in front of me with a smile on his face. His hands are on his hips and he looks at me expectantly. I should say something. Yeah, that, that was me. Why? I respond. That was a pretty badass fight, he says. Uh, my row was as a gawky jerk. Uh, good, good on you. Thanks. After an uncomfortable moment passes, he turns around and goes back to his table. I slowly let out my breath I didn't realize I was holding and turn back around to the bar once he sits down. As I will my heart to slow down, I realize the bartender has stopped talking and is looking at me with a mixture of shock and pity. I guess that's an improvement over disgust. Can I have another? I ask her. Sure, hun, she says, with the same cheeriness as before. I still can't tell if it's forced or not. As I drink my poison, I start thinking about the rest of my day. I hope Turner doesn't mind if I spend a little extra time in his grave today. I need to tell him about what happened, even if he can't hear me. End of story. Story number two. Humans are individuals. Written by Death Clock 36. The humans are a young species. Despite this, they had carved themselves a small area of territory in the local cluster by the time the wider galaxy became aware of them. We are the Akari, and like almost every other sentient species in the galaxy, we are a hive mind. The mind is what has allowed us to conquer our whole world, a car. It is what allowed us to unravel the mysteries of FDL travel, and thereby earn our place amongst the stars. Unfortunately, we were not the first to encounter the humans. That dubious honor fell to the now fallen Faraki. The Faraki were like us in some respects, in that their minds were all one. But unlike us, they use their single mind to subjugate many minor civilizations. 
The defeated mines were then forcibly assimilated into the Fakari's own as slave mines. While the greater mines in the galaxy represented too much of a challenge for them, weaker mines fell like wheat before the scythe to their armies. The Voraki first encountered the isolated human outpost. We were able to piece together what happened to the Faraki from their own fragmented reports and from the tales of the humans themselves. It began when the Faraki raiding party captured a human scientist working on a remote asteroid outpost. Had humanity been like us, the request for his mind surrender would have been interpreted entirely different. But humanity is not like us. They are a species of individuals. When the Faraki issued their demand for surrender, the human scientists did not react with fear that the Faraki expected. Instead, there was a moment of deep confusion before the human replied, What do you mean, our mind? There is only one of me. There was another moment of confusion, this time from the Faraki. You are the sole survivor of your race, they asked, deeply perplexed. No, there are billions of us. I'm not really sure I'm the one you should be speaking to, replied the equally flummoxed scientist. The Faraki mind was set in place. They had met with truly unique species. Unfortunately, the predatory mature of the mind sought only to dominate rather than to learn. Alas, the tragedy that follows was solely on their own devising. Now there more nearby, asked the Faraki. Yes, there's a small facility just over the ridge. If you'd like to speak to my supervisor, said the scientist warily. Of course, it didn't take long for the heavily armed raiders to capture a score of undefended scientists in a laboratory. The captives were taken aboard the Faraki ship and immediately placed in assimilation cells. But then, the inexplicable happened. The moment the human minds entered the Faraki mind, there was a shudder that ran across it. As one, the entire Faraki species froze as their minds came under brutal assault. Entire communities forgot why they had gotten up to go to the kitchen, without a notion of what a kitchen even was. Waves of melancholy engulfed cities caused thousands of unprepared Faraki to take their own lives. Creatures used to unbreakable focus suddenly found that they could not concentrate on a simple task for more than a few minutes. The human condition spread like wildfire through the Faraki mind as the rebellious humans fought to break free of the unnatural process that they had undergone. The fierce individualism that we have come to know their species for ravaged the mindscape of Faraki society until it finally collapsed under the strain. Across the empire, millions of Faraki fell dead like puppets with their strings cut. Millions more forcibly tore themselves free to escape the wave of death. Each of them took with them a small fragment of the Faraki mind until nothing remained. We Akari have since met with the humans. We have learned much from them, and they from us. But one thing we have learned above all else, human individuality will always endure. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.